our third session now on Ephesians 6, 5 to 9, I'm going to do something very different than usual. Uh, I'm going to step back and look at a couple dozen texts in order to address the question, does the New Testament teach the legitimacy of slavery? This is a huge question in our day. It has been uh, in America ever since the beginning because we have a a history of slavery in this land of the most uh, despicable kind. So does the New Testament give warrant for that? Let's read the text and then step back and get the big picture, and I'll try to show you my conclusion. Slaves, obey your lords according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart, as you obey Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the soul, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that if he does anything good, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Lords, do the same things to them, ceasing your threatening, knowing that he who is both their Lord and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. So the question is, does a text like this, plus one in Colossians and one in First Timothy, do these texts that seem to leave slavery in place teach the goodness or the legitimacy of slave owning? Father, Guide us now as we pose this question so that we think your thoughts. Pray this in Jesus' name. So what I'm going to do is just read a lot of passages which I think have a bearing on how Paul, or the New Testament in general, conceived of master-slave relations. See what the implications are in your own mind. Man stealing kidnapping, stealing somebody to sell them, is condemned in 1 Timothy, calling into question the source of much slavery. All human beings are created in the likeness of God, with implications of respect. I won't mention the text. You can pause and look them up. Christians are to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Christians are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. All Christians have put on Christ, so there is neither slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. As one body in Christ, slave and free, we are members one of another. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Slaves and masters, heirs. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. From the Lord, slaves will receive the inheritance, same inheritance as masters, as your reward. In the church, each believer is a new person, so there is neither slave nor free. Christ is in all, in all believers, slave and free. He who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. If you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Slaves, obey with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Slaves, obey your masters as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Slaves, keep in mind that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, stop your threatening. Masters, 
know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Masters, treat your bondservants, your slaves, justly and fairly. Philemon is to welcome back his runaway slave, Onesimus, now a Christian. He's to welcome him back no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. That's the end of the text. Now some implications. If a Christian slave owner and a Christian slave obey all these teachings, the relationship would be radically transformed. The master is transformed from owner to one who is owned by Christ along with his slave. The slave is transformed from property to co-heir of Christ with the master. And now here's my final statement. In spite of all this transformation, the New Testament does not say, in so many words, there are no more master-slave relations in the church. The roles are so transformed by Christian reality that what they once were is no more. But the social shell seems to remain. Paul addresses masters as masters. He addresses slaves as slaves. Paul does not say to masters directly, cease to be in the social position of masters. Nor does he say to slaves directly, cease to be in the social position of slaves. Though he does say, if you can gain your freedom, do it. What we might call the social structure or the shell of this institution is left in place in the New Testament. That's what troubles us, isn't it? We wonder why Paul just doesn't say, hey, there is no such thing as slavery and masters. So we wouldn't even have to address them. It doesn't exist anymore in the church. And he doesn't do that. And I'm sure there are good reasons for why he doesn't do it, but he doesn't. But for Christians, it is only a shell, a social structure whose inner reality is radically new. So much so that within this community, within the Christian community, even if labels slave and master persisted, the structure is not what it was. It is not slavery.